Hello, I'm a fraudster, and I'm going to scare the living daylights out of more than one in five of you. Your online password is... Adding numbers, capitals and symbols makes your password stronger. Hello and welcome to the Pondering Primates podcast, the official podcast of the University of Edinburgh Atheist, Humanist and Secularist Society. My name is Daniel Sharp, I'm the president of that society and your usual host. The podcast is a veritable cornucopia. We have different guests on each episode to discuss a range of issues from religion and secularism to film, art and literature. If you want to contribute, then do get in touch. Our social media and contact details can be found on the Anchor page, but we're easily found by searching our name on Facebook, and our Twitter handle is at UOE at HumSegSock. So, with all that out of the way, are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. It's Daniel here. Uh, Thanks for tuning in to the latest episodes. Today I'm speaking to a man who probably needs no introduction, uh, but I shall provide one anyway. Peter Hitchens is an English journalist and author who writes for the Mail on Sunday. Once a revolutionary socialist, he has long since been a Burkean conservative and Anglican Christian who believes that Britain has lost its way over the past century. He views British society as irredeemably fallen thanks to the decline of Christianity, marriage and traditional values. He's been a foreign correspondent in Moscow and Washington. He's travelled widely and written on a multitude of topics. His books include The Abolition of Britain, The Abolition of Liberty, The Rage Against God, Short Breaks in Mordor, and most recently, The Phony Victory. Uh, I think we'll be having a fairly wide-ranging chat today. Uh, but without further ado, hello, and thank you very much for talking to me, Peter. My pleasure so far. So is there anything else uh, you'd like to add to that introduction? No, uh, no, no, you see that. Okay, so, um, I think you've uh, probably worn yourself out speaking about uh, your quote-unquote journey uh, politically and religiously and socially. Um, well, I've just said it so many times, it always seems to me that anybody who was interested would know by now. Yes, yes, I imagine so. That's not even a very interesting answer. Yes, so I won't. I, I don't want to dwell on that too much. I just wanted to ask. Um, looking around Britain at the moment, uh, do you see anything, even the faintest sort of glimmer of of hope? Any- no, on the contrary, I, I see a, a teenage government failing and floundering, and an extraordinary, really extraordinary thing is the, the willingness of so many people to accept. Though I know a lot of people don't, but a lot of people do anything the government says uh, and a, there is as far as I can see no parliamentary opposition worth the word uh, and there's an extraordinary un- unanimity in, in much of the media as well which during my uh, teens and, and, and youth was absolutely not the case and there was, there was huge disagreement between say the Telegraph and the Guardian whereas now they're virtually unanimous on all major matters. It's really disturbing. Mm. Do you think, um, what do you think of the opposition, such as it is, the parliamentary opposition, well, the Labour Party? Yeah. Yeah, there is, it, it, on, on matters of, of, of grave importance that one can think of, and the whole point of an opposition is to test the government. If the government's policy is, is good, then tough opposition won't harm it. Uh, it, will, it will strengthen it, because the government will be able to make its position more coherent and defend itself, and quite possibly a, a, a government policy which is basically good, but which has been badly drafted, will be improved by good, strong opposition, because the opposition will be able to point out important flaws in it, which the government can then correct. Strong opposition is very important to the government, but the moment you don't get it, uh, the, either they talk past each other completely, or, or on issues such as the current response to the coronavirus, and indeed the, the, the plans to make quite severe restrictions on civil liberty, there hasn't really been much sign from the principal opposition party, the Labour Party, or indeed from any of the other parties, of anybody thinking critically about this and saying, actually, I'm paid to be here to be critical. They're not earning their rations. And it's similarly, in, in much of the media, very, very few people are prepared to say anything at all about this, except, great, let's do more of it. Well, 
you may feel that way, but honestly, if, if that's the way you feel in the country I grew up in, then you're in the wrong trade. The whole purpose of, of proper journalism and of proper uh, opposition politics is to question authority. There's nothing wrong or evil about questioning authority in a free country. It's a duty where you think something's wrong and do it for the sake of it. But you should certainly, if someone comes along with a raft of measures like the 300-page coronavirus bill, you should say, well, I don't know, mate, we need to look at this bit before we just cram it through Parliament in an afternoon. Yes, well, I think that's uh, today that's going through, the day we speak, the 23rd of March. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole load of emergency service vehicles going past my office at the moment, so I couldn't, I couldn't hear that. Oh, yeah, no, I was uh, just I saying... I quite why they need to make so much noise since the streets are all completely <laughs> empty, but there it is, they do do it. Uh, and could, you say, could you say that again? Yes, uh, yes, no, it's today, I believe, that uh, uh, as we speak on the 23rd of March, that the bill is going to go through Parliament. Um, I think, no, I, th- I do, I completely agree with you, um, I think that's an incredibly... Wait, you, mustn't, you mustn't do too much of that, or I'll <laughs> for the audience, if you, if you agree with me, it's half the point of having, of having no opposition. I mean, that's true. <laughs> an argument without disagreement is one is an unproductive argument. Yeah. All the best debates are between people who really disagree with each other. Yes, yeah, so, well, it may also get uh, me into trouble. A BBC Radio 4 program called The Good Read. It's terrible that the, the heart sinks when, when all the, the, both the people on the panel say, oh, yes, I love this book. You want one to say, I hated this book. It was terrible. <laughs> and that, from that point onwards, there'll be a proper discussion of it. When they go, oh, I love this book. It was marvellous. You think, oh, no, boring is what's coming. So, mm-hmm. so don't, don't agree with me. Oh, well, I... I mean, do it. I mean, do it if you want to, but it's not going to make for much, much, of, much of a sparks flying conversation, is it? Well, I, well, I agree on that matter. Though I do think um, that the coronavirus uh, situation is a lot more serious than perhaps you think it is. Um, well, I don't, I've never said it wasn't serious. I mean, it's, it, it's always serious when people are dying and when they're ill. The question is not how serious it is. The question is whether the response to it is proportionate, reasonable, and effective. Yeah. Uh, you know, with the, the the country could be being invaded by by, by a foreign power, uh, and that would be serious. But if the government's response to that seems to me to be misbegotten and mistaken, I'd say so. I would be because I didn't think it was serious. Because I think the the response is is mistaken. I don't to let anybody con you into 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 that. So Hitchens is complacent. Hitchens wants people to die and all that kind of rubbish. Oh, yes, I no, I didn't. I didn't mean that. I don't want people to die any more than anybody else does. But I don't. I don't necessarily think the measures which are being proposed. If I don't think the measures which are being proposed have any record at all of preventing death or suffering, and they may well actually uh, create death and suffering either in, in, in the future or even immediately if they're as misconceived as I think they are. For certain, I'd like to see the government forced to defend them a bit more because, if it, again, if it were forced to defend them a bit more, I think it would improve its policies. That's the purpose yeah. of my criticism. Yeah, no, I just, I think that with the, all of the all of the bill that's going through and all of the measures that have been taken, I do agree, I do think, actually, that lockdown uh, does work. And it's probably a do good you know thing. Lockdown, do you know where the phrase lockdown comes from? I don't know. It comes from prison. Yeah, oh well, yeah. <laughs> what you do to convicts in a prison. And we're not convicts in a prison. We're, the, we're, we're free people in a free country. And, uh, and the idea that we, we should be completely deprived of our freedom of, of, of movement, our freedom to work, uh, and the, the, that our economy should be shut down, requires a very, very strong piece of justification, which it hasn't got. Can you give me any evidence at all uh, that this policy will actually save a single life? Uh, well, I th- any reason to believe that it will? Because there isn't any. Uh, there, there's absolutely none. There are, there are the what is fascinating about the development of the coronavirus in all the countries where it's where it's appeared is the very, very different ways in which it's behaved, and it, the, there is no discernible connection between this kind of policy and reducing incidents. Sorry, and you look at, at, at South Korea; they didn't do this. You look at Japan; they're not doing it. Uh, and yet the the, the incidence is, is either as, 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 as slowed or is nothing like as great as it is here. Everyone goes on about Italy, uh, but they don't examine the peculiarities of Italy. Uh, and, and, and they just sort of keep on saying, well, if, if it's happened in Italy, it will happen here. And the, and, the, and the other point that one has to make about Italy is that Italy has been engaged in these despotic activities for some time. It doesn't seem to have made much difference to the rate of increase of the disease. I think it's a very, very 
shaky foundation on which to act. Yeah. People should, you know, be, if, if you're going to take action of this magnitude, you surely need more evidence than, than this. I, the, the, the damage being done to the, to the British economy by the current measures is colossal. Uh, the, the cost of it will be, will be burdening people. Because I spent my, my entire childhood in what had previously been quite a prosperous country was spent in a sort of shabby um, uh, and, 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 and I won't say poor because we weren't poor but, but this, was a, this, was, this was a shabby country of bad food and, and unrepaired damage for many, many years because we were in huge debt from the Second World War. And no one says we shouldn't have fought the Second World War because we obviously should have done it. But we, it, it cost an awful lot of money, but it was absolutely essential that we should do it. But it landed us ever afterwards, or for, for 40 or so years afterwards, with a debt so huge, there was never any money enough for anything. What do you think people, what do people think will happen to the National Health Service as a result of the economic de decline which we're forcing on ourselves by closing down the economy now? And people will die. As a result of that, people will die from for other reasons caused by it. Nutrition will decline, general public health will decline, the, the control over air pollution will decline. In a poorer country, these things happen. And I just you know that the, the, the balance is not is not being seriously considered here. No, I think. Well, my view is essentially that. I mean, in terms of like South, South Korea and South Korea acted incredibly quickly and did introduce quite some intrusive measures. You know. Uh, kind of testing at the border, forced testing. I'm sorry, you've got, the, I, you're, you're, you've got, I can barely hear you. Oh. You're, um, you're, the, oh. the quality of the line is, is very poor. Yeah. Sorry, we're battling technology as well. Um, no, I was talking about South Korea, and yes. I think the reason that that has been so well handled is because they acted incredibly early. And some of the measures they did introduce well, what were... What did they do? Uh, they tested... Uh, they tested, yeah. So, 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 and, what, and, and what effects is that going to have? Do you, do you, if, you, if you test a lot, is the coronavirus going to get frightened and run away because it's being tested? No, 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 but they put they tested yeah, so, and so why, why is, quarantined. Why would, test, why would testing have led to a, a rapid decline in the incidence of the disease? Uh, well, they tested uh, pretty much everyone they could and, you know, they quarantined them. They even, I believe, actually, they took people who had tested positive their uh Phone records and internet but records to continue to function. Yeah, but there was there were still some big measures of what we would call well, sort of invasions of privacy. There was nothing remotely resembling what we've embarked on. They didn't shut down the economy. That's yeah, but I think that's because they acted early enough to avoid well, no, that. It, 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 it's as I say, it's, you, they, they didn't shut down the economy. What they did do, uh, as far as we can't can't be connected physically with the, with the failure of the disease to spread on, the, on, on, on any great scale. It just, it just stopped spreading. You're doing as a post-hoc ergo propter hoc mistake. But the fact is, what they didn't do was what we were doing, and yet the disease declined. And in Japan, they're not doing what we're doing, and the disease is at a much lower level than it is here. So what do we, what do we learn from this? What we learn from this is we don't actually know what measures prevent its speed? And yet we've seized with total conviction the idea that shutting down the economy will prevent its spread. I suppose, I mean, actually, I believe, if I remember correctly, I think some of the Italian figures have kind of started to decline a little bit um, after all, you know, these uh, major kind of lockdown and shutdown and so on. Well, what lockdown and shutdown? Well, they complete... And, 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 and the fact that it does so afterwards, as I say, this is the great error, of the, the, most, the most common error in logic and science, post-talk, go, go, prop talk. this happened, then this happened afterwards, therefore the second thing which happened, happened because of the first thing. You have to prove causation. There isn't any proof that there's causation. No, we can't. I don't think we can prove any more than correlation, but taking into account all the available evidence of that, of what we know... Everywhere, wouldn't it? That those who had those who had shut down their economies had had experienced a, a decline in the disease, and those who hadn't shut down their economies uh, had not. But that's there is no such correlation. In some countries, they shut down the economy, uh, and in those countries, as far as I know, the disease isn't in decline uh, so far. In other countries, they didn't shut down the economy, and the disease did decline. You haven't even got a correlation. Yeah, but I think in a lot like we have to. Of such moment and importance and hugeness and the effect on, on, on our future lives is so 
huge. It really needs a bit more of a justification than than has been provided for it. Actually, I do. I... Proper opposition in this country saying, "Well, hang on, what is it? You know, on what are you basing this action?" Then we might be taking more intelligent action than we are. I, there are all kinds of things worth doing. Certainly, the, the, one of the things that one should do is is to be discovering how many uh, frontline medical staff have had the, have, have, have had coronavirus. Because if you if you've got people who are immune from from having had it, because so many people have it without symptoms. Then uh, you you could obviously make sure that those who hadn't had it were kept away from frontline duties and the danger of infection. Just for a start, I think there is some of that being done, but I, it, that that would be a rational action being taken, because obviously the the concentrated effect of the virus is going to be on the on the medical staff who are treating those who are suffering most acutely from it. Yes, I mean I do agree that, that there that should that would be a rational action which anybody anybody would say yes, of course you should do that. But I still don't see why shutting down the entire economy is going, is, 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 is going to prevent it. Also, it's a simple matter of scale. And I, I, keep, on, I keep on pointing this out. I, it, it, it is, it, it, if you go, I went to the Department of, of, of Health and Social Care last, last week, and I said, well, how many deaths have been recorded this year from various types of influenza or other infections, not including COVID-19? The answer I got was the number of flu cases and deaths due to flu-related complications will vary each flu season. The average number of deaths in England, and this, this is always the English department, uh, for the last five seasons, and they, that's from 2014, 15 to 2018, 2019, the average number of deaths from, from due to flu-related complications, 17,000 a year. 17,000 deaths a year, average. And that... The, that range from 1,692 deaths last season to 28,330 deaths in, in the 2014-15 season. And it, they added that in of these deaths, in many cases, involved people with underlying health conditions. Now, nothing remotely resembling that has resulted from the, from the COVID-19 virus yet. Uh, and yet we're treating it as a national emergency on the scale of, I don't know, the First World War. And you probably know this, but in the United Kingdom, 1,600 people die every day. Normally, that is the normal mortality figure. There's number of people who die every day. You need to get these things into perspective. Every one of those deaths is a blow and a grief to those intimately involved. But that doesn't mean that society has to uh, has to engage in, in frantic and, and, uh, and devastating uh, policies such as the close down of the economy and the attack on civil liberties, which Mr. Johnson has chosen to follow. Yes, no, well, I, I'm totally on board with the civil liberties thing. In fact, I, I did, as you recommended, on Twitter and wrote to my MP uh, about that. Well, I'm very grateful to you for doing that because it's, it's, it's nice that people pay attention. I think it does, oddly enough, it does make a difference. If they don't hear, then they have no idea that anybody is disturbed about it. Yes, no, I, I mean, my... There's a tiny bit of... I, I haven't seen exactly what's happened so far today. There's been a tiny bit of a retreat in them. The government is now prepared to consider making the, 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 the legislation much more time-limited than it was before. Yeah. But, uh, whether it's justified by these circumstances at all is a, is, is a deeper question. Yeah, well, that would be my uh, my kind of condition of it. It would have to be complete, uh, very strictly um, yeah, time-limited and overseen. These, these facts that but, yes. I got out of the DHSC last week, and, uh, I, again... Um, I asked, for, asked them if, they, if, if all, all the deaths from the listed from the virus have tested positive, uh, and they said, yes, they have. And then I said, do all those listed as having died from the virus have coronavirus or COVID-19 listed as the principal cause of death on their death certificates? Uh, and and some, some, some additional questions to that. The, the reply I got was very interesting. We have not announced cause of death. Each announcement states the number of people who have died with a positive test for coronavirus. Now, it's a cliche, you're probably aware of, that many, many people in this country die uh, with uh, prostate cancer. Many men die and they're suffering from prostate cancer, but they don't die of it. Mm. The fact that you have a disease at the time you die doesn't necessarily mean that's the main cause of death. And the, the number of, of patients dying from underlying conditions or having suffering from major underlying conditions who died of, of, of COVID-19 is, is huge. And here's a fascinating thing which needs to be examined once this is over. Uh, so to what extent has the actual death rate, is the 1,600-a-day death rate, increased during this period? Mm. Or are we, are we, it may have increased. 
increased, or it is, or possibly we are classifying people as having died with coronavirus who, who might well have died anyway of other causes because they were already uh, it's severely ill. You see what I'm getting at? It's not, yeah. it's, it's, so in, in, on the basis of this, we we are we're embarking, as I say, on, on one of the, on the most radical government policy I have ever seen in a life of nearly 70 years. Mm. I've never seen anything like it. Now, is this really a, a, a sufficient justification for, for actions as radical as this? Yes, well... I mean, surely to, take a, to take a crisis seriously is to examine it seriously and to work out things which will be effective against it. Uh, I, I'm not sure that this... That we're here in something must be done territory. Here's a, here's a, a nasty disease which has entered our country and, and, and people are dying of it and it's causing a strain to the national health service, which is, I have to say, almost always under strain in the winter from, from mm. infections, not wholly dissimilar from this. And, and somebody said, so, well, something must be done. And someone else has come along and said, well, this is something. And so they, we've done it. But whether it's been seriously measured to deal with the actual crisis that we're facing doesn't seem to me to be established. And the difficulty is that if you do as I do and, 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 have, and have done, say, well, I'm not sure that this is right, instead of people saying, hmm, interesting, let's look into that, uh, you get people saying, why don't you shut up? You, should, you shouldn't be allowed to be published. You should be removed from your newspaper. You should be fired. Uh, and, and, and that's the mild part. Uh, apart from the the, the, the four-letter words you get from celebrities whipping up their their, yeah. their followers, and it, rather than anybody saying, "Well, okay, all right, then let's debate it," you don't get that. You're you're basically treated as some kind of thought criminal who's, uh, who's who's denying there's any problem, and who callously wishes to see the deaths of millions. Mm. I don't wish to see the deaths of millions any more than anybody else. I just think if you're going to prevent deaths, your policy has to be intelligent, targeted, and directed at the problem you actually face. And for that, as I say, I don't, I, 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 I shouldn't have to expect a peace. Yeah. I should get, I should get a rational response. And if somebody wants to say, well, you're wrong, we can absolutely establish that, that crashing the economy is the only way we're going, we're going to do this. Uh, or even it's a reasonable way of achieving it. Then I'll, everyone will listen to them and say, okay, they, that's it, it's polished off. But that's not what I get. I get abuse. Yeah. I, uh... Shut up. <laughs> the, the worst of those is shut up. The worst of those is you shouldn't be allowed to say this. Mm. So what's the point of having a free society uh, if you aren't allowed to say anything at times of crisis? Yes, I suppose it's uh, that's part of a broader issue as well. I suppose it's not just this issue. I, I'm sure you've written many things where people have told you that you shouldn't be saying that and that you shouldn't be allowed to say it. That uh, happens all the time. I'm afraid it's such a dull and, 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 un, and unproductive response. I, I, I can argue till the cows come home about facts and logic. But if, so, if someone just if someone's at a response to being disagreed with is to demand that the person who's who, who is disagree with them should be silenced, then really the, it, there isn't much else left to say, is there? I wonder if you think uh, you've written the abolition of liberty about attacks on civil liberties. Uh, do you think yeah. this is uh, obviously? You believe it's a, an issue that has roots going back a few decades at least. Uh, do you think the coronavirus then has uh, provided a kind of catalyst or a, a, something to speed up that process that was already I ongoing? Like increasingly, the, what, the, 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 the attempts to silence me, and I, I'm, I'm freer than most people because I'm an actual newspaper columnist and it, it, I have therefore a, a, a stronger platform than most people. If, if I've worked in the public service sector, in the, say a state school or something like that, I couldn't say many of the things that I said because I would probably be fired for saying them, uh, but I'm freer to say things than most people. What I find more and more is the case is that there is a generally accepted idea of what is good and that the person who disagrees with it is therefore themselves bad. Yeah. Not wrong, but bad. Yeah. And that this, that my moral failings, my, my callousness towards the, the old and ill as alleged on this occasion, or my callousness towards the victims of non-existent callousness, I say, victims of, uh, of war in Syria or whatever it might be, uh, is therefore a, a reason for me to be silenced and removed from the public debate. Yeah. It's a, do it's a do dogmatic society. We're going back towards the Middle Ages where it, it, anybody who didn't agree with the, uh, with the uh, official consensus uh, was actually a sort of criminal, and in many, it, 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 the, the interesting thing about the modern world is it, 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 
the terroristy hunts do not tend to end in people being burned at the stake. But what they do end with, if they can possibly manage it, is the, is the, the sense of being driven out of public life, deprived of a platform, and, uh, and, 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 and the, the, one of the principal ways in which people are removed from and punished from uh, and punished is, of course, to take away their employment. Yeah, I wonder if that is that is that Which progress is a of a sort. <laughs> way of, of the, the, the old method of putting them in prison because if you put people in prison for stating opinion, there'll always be a certain number of people who say, "Hang on a minute, surely this is a free country." Uh, but if you if you if you attack them by destroying their livelihood, then that's okay. It's it's, it's extraordinary how mm. how you how you how, how we get away with this as a, as a means of social control. Amnesty International will not intervene in a country where people are fired for expressing the wrong opinion. They might say something if you were locked up there. It reminds me of um, the party inquisitor in 1984, who mentioned that in the middle in the Middle Ages you would burn heretics, uh, but that would just create martyrs. Uh, the, the yeah, they're, 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 people have learned that this is the, the, yeah. and it, what, what's interesting about the intolerant uh, utopian is that they have learned a lot from their failures. They they know uh, the, the one thing they haven't learned is that it's the utopian, but they they have learned a lot from the failures of the Soviet Union uh, in terms of economic and political action, and they've also learned a lot from the the, the, the creation of martyrs in the past. They don't want to do that. I wonder then if it's uh, religious zeal uh, turned towards secular purposes uh, given that you know most people in the West, uh, well Christianity as you well know is, is, has declined considerably in the West um, is this a kind of uh, subversion of that old spirit towards new purposes? I don't know I th- I, nothing has a single cause but I do feel that the electronic media starting with television and then moving on to, to social media do tend to create a much more conformist cast of mind. Uh, they, people only see one version of things. Uh, they only see the one they want to see. Uh, the, the Twitter mob can very easily be turned on the dissenter to, to frighten him or her into silence. Or, and, 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 and it's very effective. People are frightened by it. Uh, as in my view, they shouldn't be as frightened as they are. And, and, but they... There is something about electronic media which which makes it tends towards making everybody the same. Yeah, well, that that's the danger. I think that Twitter. has a lot to do with it. It's it's the only the circle of friends, the family, the um, the church, the school, all the things which used to form opinion and create much more diverse types of person have all really been pushed to one side uh, by the the marvels which are contained in all our mobile phones. Yeah. Though I, d- I do think, uh, again, it's always a question of balance. I think there are some emancipatory consequences to the new social media, especially in countries uh, or in places like Hong Kong, uh, where social media has been a, a massive kind of boost to dissent and to, to organisation of, of opposition to the CCP. And, of course, the, the, old, the old ways of doing things, such as church and family and home, could also... Uh, breeds conformity as well because people didn't have access to a wider range of argument yeah, or... Yeah, I mean, there were other forms of conformity in the past and I think they were, they were often um, extremely uh, damaging but I don't think they, any of them reached the, 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 the level and power of what we have now. Mm. They, were, they were competing conformities. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 the country used to be divided. Uh, every major city would have two newspapers, one, that's, you know, for, to, to, to simplify it, one Liberal and one Tory. Uh, and, that, uh, and so there was, uh, and the great thing about that, and this is a thing I often quote, Michael Richard Neville, who was editor of a, of a counterculture magazine called Oz back in the 1960s, and he said... There is an inch of difference between the Conservative Party and the Labour Party, but it is in that inch that we all live. Mm. And of course, once that inch had closed, which it, in my view has done, and there is no real difference between the two major parties now in, in, in many practical terms, there isn't very much space for dissent to take place. No. Yeah. I think Sweater brings so out the worst. There, were, there, were, there, were, there was certainly conformism before, but it, 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 it's. Um, it was there were competing conformisms, mm. and that, rather than just one. Yeah. 
No, there are some truly horrific stories of people being fired because of Twitter brigades uh, emailing their employers because they've said something um, unorthodox. Oh, that's it's terrible. Um, well, I think I could. I wanted also to come on to, as you no doubt have been able to ascertain, I am Scottish, uh, so I thought we could take a look at the kind of uh, the Scottish dimension of. Of the of of current affairs, uh, I think you wrote in 2014 about coming to to Scotland, Rosyth and Cowdenbeath and so on, and I think you said in that column that you think there will be another referendum and that it will go the opposite way, uh, which I well, that's what I used to think. I'm I'm not sure, I'm not as sure now as I was because I think that the the issue has not been handled with enormous brilliance by Nicola Sturgeon lately, and I I think the SNP maybe having a moment of, of weakness, but it's, it, it, this, the politics has changed so much in the past um, in the past couple of years that the predictions which one made before don't quite work as well as they did. And then there's the implications of what will actually happen when Britain leaves the European Union, which it hasn't yet done, but will do at mm. the end of the year, unless, unless this virus crisis postpones that too, which I wouldn't totally rule out. Uh, so I'm not sure. I think there is. I, I, ha, I have. I got the very strong impression when I went up for the last referendum that the young were pretty much committed uh, to going for independence, mm. and that it was only the vote of the, of the older Scots which which was preventing that from ha- happening. And of course, by the, the natural process, if you hold another referendum, the the people who took the old-fashioned unionist view, there will be fewer of them in the future than there are now. And therefore, I think that the, the, the mathematical chances are that it will happen. But of course, the, the, the complexities created by the departure from the EU uh, are quite considerable. And although, to some extent, you know, the uh, pro-EU members in Scotland now have a bigger motive to vote to leave, on the other hand, the apprehension of what Scotland might have to undergo uh, to leave the United Kingdom and apply for membership of the EU, which I think it would do, is 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 quite daunting. I, I don't, I'm not quite as sure as I was. Yeah, I well, there's another thing which is it's kind of a double-edged sword. I mean, I think the Brexit vote has been uh, an, a useful tool in the hands of the SNP and other independence movements, as has the fact that there is now a majority Tory government in Westminster, which is always a sure thing to fire up the Scots. It, it generally helps. But yeah. On, uh, in, 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 certain, in, in terms of anybody doing anything radical in Scotland, they have the, 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 the Tories to complain about. On the other hand, the Scottish politics has been so transformed by the collapse of the Labour Party that one wonders mm. again, what, who will benefit from this? Yeah. I think uh, the great historian uh, T.M. Devine once said that one of the decisive factors in any referendum will be that uh, if there's a Tory Prime Minister, there is no Tory Prime Minister who'd want to be the man who, or the woman who, who destroyed the Union or who lost Scotland, you know, the Conservative and Unionist Party, and that may well be a decisive factor. I think a Tory government will always try and do something maybe, to... Maybe, maybe. This isn't a very Tory Tory government. Yeah, but I think it's more just the uh, the sort of historical association with the unionism uh, which it, may it, exercise. It was fascinating in the Thatcher era, just how as soon as you got north of the border, the whole Tory attitude towards things like public spending completely reversed itself. <laughs> and Scottish Toryism was very much in those days a matter of trying to spend their way into staying alive. And if you look at even the nineteen eighties, the strength of the Tory Party in Scotland in those days was so much greater than now. It was, it was impossible to, 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 for it to get anyone to believe now as it took Tories what's kind of majority of, mm. of uh, the Scottish seats at Westminster and the daily record was a Tory paper. Yeah. <laughs> there you are. These things were true. Uh, but that, that, that was because unionism was so important in those days. And now unionism is, 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 is not. Mm. Yeah, there's a... Uh... There's a strange... I wonder if it's cyclical. Uh, we had the Tory-dominated Scotland um, many decades ago, then Labour, now it's the SNP's turn. Um, yeah, maybe. I don't know. There's, what has, has not developed is any really counterbalancing 
opposition to no. the SNP within nationalism. So that you might expect this to be a, a left wing and a right wing national party, but yeah. there isn't. There hasn't been. No, uh, yeah. I don't know. It's it's it, it is fascinating, uh, but it, it, I I would never have predicted the collapse of Labour in Scotland, and I, no. I, as a result, I feel a bit. Uh, I, I feel I feel a bit lost in trying to work out what may happen next. Yeah. Well, I think if we've learned anything the past few years, it's uh, the unpredictability of... But I, I will say one thing, which is that when I was looking at the referendum, I, 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 I was very annoyed by the, the scare campaign, which some people in, in, were waging against the, uh, the, the, the leave voters. I thought it was unfair, and I thought it was panic mongering. I thought it was wrong. I, it didn't seem to me to have anything to do with the case. I thought, if you've got a case for maintaining the union, then argue that. But don't try and frighten people into voting for something that they would otherwise want to do. And funnily enough, of course, when the same tactics were used in the European Union referendum mm. in the whole United Kingdom, I resented them just as much. And you won't find many people who was consistently against scare tactics in both those referendums. Yeah. But I was. And this is... I, I had a... I won't call it a sneaking sympathy because that's not quite right. I could see when I was walking uh, uh, along the, the roads of Recife and Dunfermline on the evening of the referendum, but I could see why a Scottish person might want to vote for independence. To some extent... I, and this, if you're a, a British or an English patriot, and I'm probably both, and Cornish have pushed as well, <laughs> I can't, I can't really resent anybody else's patriotism or think it wrong, can I? No. And I have to have some sort of sympathy with it. I have the same thing in Ireland. I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm very much against the pr provisional Sinn Féin. And I get as a result accused of being some kind of Irish, but I'm not. I think there's a lot of Irish, uh, Irish uh, nationalism has a strong case, especially since 1916, which is very, very hard uh, for any uh, patriot in any other uh, society or country to, to, to deny. And I, uh, and I had that same problem. I thought, yeah, I don't blame you. Mm. If, you want to, if, you, if you want to go off and, and do this and try it on your own, I don't blame you at all. Uh, if I was Scottish, I'd do it myself. I, I, it, it wasn't what I intended to think or indeed what I intended to say, but it was what I thought and said that rather nice sunny evening. Mm. Yes, I th uh, there's an interesting disconnect, I think, between Scotland and England, because English, you know, if, if uh, people from Europe or whatever tell, say, oh, you're from England, are you, to a Scottish holidaymaker, that Scottish uh, holidaymaker will... Oh, fools, they begin to understand how different it is. <laughs> yeah, there's, I suppose it's, uh, I think, uh, Gordon... In fact, Scotland is much more continental than England. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, you, if you half close your eyes looking out over, over, over Edinburgh from Arthur Sea, it, it, it could it's 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 much more like Prague than like London. Yeah, uh, it just is. I mean, it, there is the Scottish cities. Glasgow is is, um, is almost American. They're not. It's, they're not English. It's not. It's it's a totally different country with a, with a completely different culture. And the English language is used in a different way. And, and the law is, of course, this is a huge important thing. The law is different. I like the way. Uh... Gordon Brown kind of he put it. There's, I suppose, different levels of patriotism. You know, as you say, English and British and maybe Cornish. I think Scottish people who are unionists in some way, well, they'll identify first with Scotland and then on a broader level with Britain. Yeah, there's a very deep thing about being English, which I don't often express because you know, there's some unpleasant people go on about about being English, but it it is. It is very profound in a way that being British isn't quite so. Though, though being a child of the post-war era, Britishness is probably more deeply uh, inside me than it would be if I did, if I'd grown up later. Yeah. But the war, the war, very much extended and, and strengthened Britishness as long as it went on and for some time afterwards. And I was affected by that. Yeah. I do. Um. I mean, I I personally am still a unionist of. An old labour sort, I would say. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not an irrational or a foolish or, a, or, a, uh, or an impossible system. In fact, the way in which Scotland came into the Union was not by subjugation, uh, but no, by, by a, 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 a sensible mutual consent. And, and very interestingly, Scotland did not, and this was probably, if a serious long term union had been intended, probably a mistake, but the, the, the the decision to leave the Scottish legal system uh, different from the English legal system uh, 
always left the question open of, of, of whether or not Scotland might leave again. Uh, it's, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to leave the European Union. And is what I really, really feared from the European Union. I wasn't particularly bothered about the economics, but what I really feared was that ultimately our legal system would go, and we would we would go over to Roman law and civil code. And I think we'd have lost something really important by that. Mm. There's uh, there's an interest in the Scottish, the Scottish legal system to have it to continue to have from from 1707 to to, to 1997. A legal system without a parliament to legislate it was a very odd anomaly. Yeah, although I do, I do think the the keeping of certain institutions in Scotland was probably what kept the union very strong for a, for a long while. Yeah. Uh, you had the church and and the universities, uh, the legal system, the education system. Yeah, totally different. Separate, yeah, yeah, but 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 within a nonetheless within a broader political union, which yeah. was prepared to tolerate that. There's a uh, going back to the union, uh, 1707. I think as that's one of the interesting things about independence and the SNP, who kind of paint it as some sort of unwilling uh, subjugation. And they also uh, there's some rhetoric around the British Empire and Scotland's involvement in that. We sometimes tend to see ourselves as as not quite as bad as as the English. We were just uh, we were just trading. I know, which is nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. But. Um, you know, we we think, oh, we were just trading. We weren't involved with uh, fighting or or subjugating people or whatever, which is complete nonsense. Well, I, don't, but, I don't have to go into the details there, but I think there were quite a lot of quite a lot of Scotsmen very yeah. much involved in the empire, as far as yeah. I noticed. In fact, I don't think we were able we were able to to, to uh, achieve or hold on to the empire without uh, the Scots. Myself, the shock, the shock troops of the empire. Well, you could say, yeah. They seldom, they seldom yeah. let the empire down on the occasion yeah. when they were tested. Yeah. Anyway, there we are. Um, I'm, time is pressing for me. Do you have anything else you want to, you want to pursue? Uh, well, I suppose I wanted, since we're on history, I wanted to ask, uh, well, history and literature, I wanted to kind of go into that a little bit. So uh, do you have, if you, if you had three or four books, say, that you could recommend everyone should read or you wish everyone had read or would read, uh, what would they be? Uh, a book I always recommend is uh, is The Daughter of Time by Josephine Tay, uh, the most the cleverest detective story ever written, in which the, in, which is actually about the um, the Richard III case, his supposed murder of the princess in the tower, and all the mm. general Shakespeare view of Richard III as a as a crooked back. Yeah, uh, and it, it turns out not to be true. And it's, it, but it, 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 the great, if you, as you read it, if you would be brought up with the standard version of English history or indeed the standard Shakespearean version, uh, the, the whole of your mind turns. There's a point in the book where the whole of your mind turns over. In fact, Josephine Tay is brilliant about this. Uh, a, a Scotswoman, by the way, mm. absolutely brilliant about this. Uh, several of her books do work the same trick. You suddenly you're halfway down a page, and you you suddenly think the ground has opened up beneath you. It, it's all gone. Everything you previously thought in a phrase, you suddenly realise I've been wrong. Uh, and it's it's a brilliant uh, as a result stimulus to thought mm. uh, and, uh, and an enemy of complacency in thought. Uh, I would um, I, I, I I would always. So 
tells you that you thought you knew and didn't know, uh, or, or that you didn't know you didn't know. And it's, it's so easy to read. So I, those are some I'd recommend. I, there are, if one starts recommending books, well, this goes on forever. Yeah, yeah well, I think uh, one, of my, one of my very... I think you have written about it slightly once uh, as a very good book. It's probably one of my very favourite works of literature is Fire from Heaven, Mary Renault. Oh, Mary Reynolds' books are, 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 are really so good. Uh, I, I keep meaning to read the whole lot of them again. I, I, I don't know how she did it, uh, but it, they are they are an astonishing evocation of, 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 mm. of another world in which we knew it. We know it existed, but we don't really know what it was like. But if anybody has, has, has imagined what it was like better than she has, I don't yeah. know who it is. Also, she writes like a dream. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just beautiful. I mean, I was transfixed by fire yeah. from heaven. Yeah, it's marvelous. Um, so, well, to finish off, I always kind of like to ask this sort of lighter question. But when you're not engaged in battle on Twitter or being slandered or writing or speaking, what do you do to relax or chill, as the oh, kids say? I... I put in my who's who entry, long train journeys and second-hand bookshops. Uh, and this was true. Uh, so it still is to some extent. But the trouble with long train journeys used to be long, slow rattles through the countryside in trains with dining cars. And, and, and so many trains have now been modernized and made to feel like airplanes. So it's much harder to find this particular version of joy. And second-hand mm. bookshops have been massacred by the, the charity shops, so there are fewer and fewer of them. So I, I can't. I, it's still a very good summary of how I would know. Going, going on a long, slow train with a restaurant car to a cathedral city on a winter's afternoon, and uh, and, and spending uh, that afternoon peering round the corners of that cathedral, and then. Uh, perhaps staying in a creaky old hotel after having spent a little time mm. wandering around one of those very old second-hand bookshops. That's a good way of describing how I, an ideal day might be for me. Yeah, I'm getting uh, shades of Philip Larkin there. Yeah, maybe, or, a little or bit. Or M.R. James. You do yeah. know the M.R. James ghost stories? All his characters are sort of antiquaries who love hanging around mm. cathedral closes and examining carvings and old tombstones. That's me. The trouble with all M.R. James's figures is they, they have, they're too curious. Mm. <laughs> In fact, one of the stories is called A Warning to the Curious. They're too <laughs> curious. They pursue their curiosity too far, and it gets them into the most terrible trouble. <laughs> and he's right, they do. They're, I'm happy to say that so far I haven't encountered any of the horrors that his characters <laughs> encounter. They're good, too. That's another recommendation. The yeah. ghost stories of M.R. James, well, particularly Count, Count Magnus. Uh, if you've got, if you're at all suggestible, it could keep you awake for two nights in a row. After reading. Gosh. Well, I hope you don't run into any of those terrors on your own uh, yeah, well, travels. Yeah, do, but uh, there are other terrors which don't know, which 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 are um, entirely uh, banal and uh, out of the material world, which are yeah. available anyway. Yeah, there used to there used to be um, streets of second-hand bookshops in Edinburgh here in Edinburgh, and uh, now it they're. Is, it is the, the, the charity bookshops, which I think don't pay council tax or something they, 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 mm. they've rather um, put them out of business yeah uh, so is there is there anything else you would like to add any message no, no, you no, no I, I talk far too much <laughs> well it's been very enjoyable and uh, thank you very much for, for speaking to me for well, this little while yes thank you and uh, take care. goodbye <laughs>